and thank you for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of In the Studio. I'm Lynn Weaver, and today our topic will be a discussion of a recently published science fiction best selling novel called Aurora by world renowned novelist, science fiction writer, uh, and beloved Davis residents. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. Stan has uh, published more than 19 novels, uh, a lot of uh, uh, short stories, and uh, he has, uh, of course, received countless awards. And I believe he is best known for his Mars trilogy and other earlier novels that have to do with uh, the uh, atmosphere, uh, in Washington about climate change and what to do about uh, what decisions to prevent climate change. So Stan Robinson, welcome. Thank you so much for being on our show. Well, thanks for having me, Lynn. It's good to be here. It's wonderful. So um, Aurora is about life on a ship, and the ship has been flying for 160 years. It's one of those uh, space journeys and is going towards uh, one of the nearest stars, I believe, Tau uh, Ceta. So mm -hmm. what happens next? Well, um, the, it's a multi-generational starship, which is a kind of a subgenre in science fiction where you uh, take it for granted that we're never going to go faster than light. And even getting as fast as light is very much uh, not going to happen. So it takes many years to get to even the closest star. And in my story, they're arriving at Tau Ceti. And there's, we know that there were four or five big planets around Tau Ceti. We've seen them. And they're so big that they're not serviceable to humans because the gravity would be too great. Oh, interesting. But we think that there may be moons. Yes. <clears throat> And that these moons might be more uh, sizable to the similar to the size of the Earth. And so they're exploring with the idea that one of these moons has water on it. It resembles the Earth. It seems to be um, a friendly enough place that we could inhabit it. And so as the story begins, they're, be they're um, getting close and going into orbit around the moon, which they call Aurora. So Aurora is their name for that moon. Well, this is, is very interesting. It's a fascinating uh, story, and already I'm... I'm taken in by, by the plot. So in the book, the spaceship is unnamed. Right. Which is interesting. And our heroine, Freya, Freya uh, has basically, she was born and right. lives on this ship. And uh, is, her life is in transit, going towards this star. And uh, uh, she lives in a closed, albeit uh, diverse ecosystem, uh, very much like Earth, obviously. Right. Would you say this is an extended allegory of our life on Earth? Well, um, it's an interesting question. All of science fiction has a double reading uh, that can be yes. applied to it. So first, and I think very importantly, it's about what it's about. We could go to the stars, and that's worth exploring as a story space. What would it be like? Um, um, Freya is fifth or sixth generation. If uh, comparing it to like current uh, time, if she were doing her um, arrival and growing up in 2015, then the start of the starship's journey would be back around 1800, yes, um, or maybe 1820. But in any case. Uh, many generations before. So uh, the ship is all she knows, and that's why it doesn't really have a name. It's just her world. I see. Um, uh, now, so you read it as a story about what it really is about. And the Earth is a trillion times bigger ecosystem than the ship is. And so there are serious differences there, and yet they are both still um, life support systems flying through space. So yes, there is a way in which all science fiction works as both the future story and the allegory for the way things feel right now. Uh, this is interesting. And of course, the reader <clears throat> can uh, uh, see many uh, metaphors, uh, perceptions. You know, the perception of this is why books are so come alive when you read them. Um, it, it's interesting that you said from the start 
that it is basically impossible for humans to conquer the speed of light, in other words, to right. go beyond the speed of light. And it's very interesting because it's something, the topic has fascinated me. So why do you say it is impossible? Or perhaps you didn't say impossible, but nearly impossible? I don't remember exactly. Well, I think it's impossible according to the laws of physics as we understand them right now. And right. there are some quite deep mysteries. There are things we don't understand about um, the universe right now. But uh, we are material uh, creatures uh, made of flesh and blood. And um, um, light itself is uh, radically different from us. And as far as we know, nothing goes faster than light in this universe, which is why it is the way it is. There is quantum entanglement. There's mm -hmm. spooky action at a distance. Mm -hmm. We don't understand gravity or dark matter or mm -hmm. dark energy. Or dimensions. Energy. <clears throat> yes. We don't know how many dimensions there are. But there are limits to what we can do as a species given just simply uh, because of our physical nature. I don't think we can turn ourselves into electricity and then move, which would be at the speed of light, not faster, yes. to somewhere else, and then reincorporate. Mm -hmm. It's beyond us. It's uh, a very we, interesting answer. Sorry. Okay. It can't be, uh, we can't work out the navigational systems. It would be time travel as well as space travel to go faster than light. We. Um, it's, it's just one of those ideas that is a fantasy. Now, it works as allegory, and it also works to make the galaxy small enough to become a story space. You want to go to the far side of the galaxy. It's not really possible, but you want to tell a story about it. I've yes. done this myself in time travel stories. Then you say, well, you wave your hands a little and say, well, they took the chronosymclastic infundibulum, which is Kurt Vonnegut's name for yes. these made up names. Yes. And then it worked. And then yes. you have your story, but it's a kind of a fantasy. And so there's a kind of science fiction that is not about fantasy, but about what could we really do. And that's the kind of science right. fiction that Aurora is. Right. And uh, I think this very much, you've, you've very, very well, uh, you describe the, um, uh, your science fiction world, which is very realistic in a way, due to your expertise in science, your research, and the way you uh, linger on details that make it more convincing. Right. Now, you mentioned uh, 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 time travel. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask you if you are actually a disguise, disguised time traveler, uh, because you go from uh, the Ice Age shaman mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to Aurora, which right. is in the 26th century, I believe. Right. So is that something you're not telling us, Dan? No, no, no. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I am an English major, and I've lived all, most of my life now in Davis, California. And um, it's just that uh, science fiction is a really fun and powerful genre. Yes. It's, it's literature, but it's literature that allows the reader and the writer to time travel. And I think all fiction is really about time travel anyway. You want to get... Uh, telepathy and time travel. What was it like to be in the Roman Empire when things were falling apart? That's right. What was it like to be on, you know, Tau Ceti when we first landed? And also, what are other people thinking? Mm -hmm. and, a, and a really good uh, novel can make you feel like you're inside other people's heads. Yes. So that's the magic of it. Yes. Well, it is. And in <clears> a way, it's like being an actor in some ways, except that uh, uh, a writer leaves a, uh, a permanent uh, uh, recreation of, of your fantasy or, or your imagination. Now, um, your book, I couldn't, I couldn't help um, drawing some similarity from, uh, with Aurora to the margin, oh, uh, yes. the movie mm -hmm. now, which mm -hmm. was actually a, a novel written a few years ago by, what is his name? Uh, Andy Ve Weiss? Andy, Andy Ve Weir. Yeah. Weir. Mm -hmm. Weir? Yeah. And I haven't read the novel, but uh, uh, basically, have you read the novel? Do you see some similarity to this? <coughs> or you haven't? I haven't read the novel, but I've seen the movie. So, And I'm told that it's fairly faithful to the book. And um, they are similar. <coughs> They're both problem solving. They are both about people caught completely in a technological surround, like a submarine, yes. that has to function. Yes. So um, that's the uh, similarity. Um, now, really, the character in The Martian has it much easier. Um, Mars is so close to Earth relative to Tau Ceti 
that um, and yet the basic situation is the same and the same is true if you're in a scuba gear and you're 40 feet underwater and your yes. and your gear breaks yes um, anytime you're reliant on a mechanical system to keep you alive when that system falls apart you're in terrible trouble and you ha and you might be able to think your way out of it right. or you might get killed well it is very interesting and also what comes to mind is you know, there are recurring myths in mm -hmm. Western literature. Mm -hmm. And one of the recurring myths that perhaps I see here, whether you want to call it a myth or something else, a story, is, is the Robinson Crusoe story. Oh, yes. Which is, uh, you know, to me, it's a recurring thing in children's books as well as with science fiction. But what makes your book different is, of course, as you said, much farther away much more complex and uh, uh, the, the environment is not terribly uh, harsh and unfriendly right. Right. Uh, as in the Martian, I believe. But these are very fascinating topics. So I wanted to ask you, um, um, you research your novels so well. Hmm. And I was, I think I mentioned my son was particularly impressed with uh, some of your novels like uh, 60 Days and Counting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the other one I read that I like very much is uh, the f f 40 Days mm -hmm. of Rain. Mm -hmm. And you wrote those at the beginning of the 21st century. Right. And he was so impressed, and I am too, about the knowledge of Washington politicians and how right. they go about. How right. did you acquire that knowledge? Well, um, my wife works for U.S. Geological Survey, and so we spent four years in Washington, D.C., and then I also was sent to Antarctica by the National Science Foundation, and after that, I've had a, a fairly um, a frequent association with National Science Foundation. So that, 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 and that explains and it. That, yeah, that's yes. only by the help of the NSF could I have written those books. And yes. it's nice that you mention them because actually they come out next month in a compressed version, which I did myself. And it was my own idea. Oh, really? Um, slightly compressed. And it's going to be called Green Earth. It'll be at the Avid Reader, and it will be uh, everywhere. In paperback? In paperback or? and yes. as an e-book. And see. it's really about as thick as a brick. Um, it's about 1,000 pages long. But they are very long, <clears throat> yes. But yes. I, I think that it's a better book now, and it also brings it back right before the Paris Climate Summit. Right, in December. So and in fact, my right. son was mentioning that because he's... Uh, it is, and it's particularly interesting also from a UC Davis point of view because you know that it's the first time that uh, climate uh, agriculture, uh, right. uh, climate smart agriculture as they call it now, is yeah. going to be on the agenda yes. of the Paris conference, yeah. the UN conference uh, dealing with uh, climate change and what to do about it. Right. But this is very interesting. So the NSF gave you the opportunity to do what? Well, they to have an, study. Um, mm, they have an artists and writers program that sends the artists and writers to Antarctica because they run the U.S. Antarctic program. And then after yeah. that, I joined the juries to choose the other artists and writers. And after that, I went to give lectures and then to interview people and ask them about NSF. And I met Rita Caldwell, the first woman director of NSF, yes. and she taught me a lot of things that I could turn into my character, Diane Chang, who mm -hmm. was also a woman director of NSF. And so I had an awful lot of help with that book from the NSF. And having lived in Washington, D.C., I wanted to say what I knew about it. Right. So I suppose the follow-up questions, the begging question is, uh, uh, what do you think about uh, you know these books? Uh, the, the Green Trilogy was uh, published uh -huh. at the beginning yeah. of the century. Um, so what do you think about uh, the way climate change uh, uh, are being handled at the moment by the Obama administration? Well, it's always a mixed picture. Um, mm -hmm. There have been some really good moves by this administration, and there have been some strangely bad ones. Yes. Uh, opening up the Arctic to oil drilling is obviously a bad one. Yes. Uh, everything else that they've done has been very good. And, you know, this Paris summit is a really exciting moment. When I first wrote that first book, it was maybe 2001 when I started writing. That's right, yes. Uh, well, uh, Almost 15 years ago. Right. Yeah. Things have changed hugely. Yes. So. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, an added dimension mm -hmm. to your uh, author-writer world, that uh, you have this... Uh, 
this connection with the real scientists and right. this real science right. world, which is fascinating. Um, I'm afraid our time has gone very quickly and I, I could spend a whole day talking to you. However, I don't want to leave you um, without asking this question mm -hmm. because I've been very anxious to ask this question. Now, you are from the Midwest, but you moved to California very, uh, yeah. very early in life. However, yes. May I ask you, what was your first image or thought as a very young child? Well, that's interesting you ask. Uh, I've thought about that myself. Um, I, it was either a tricycle under a Christmas tree or else it was my family moving from Pasadena to Inglewood and having all of our um, belongings in a U-Haul um, wa basket like they don't make anymore at the back of a car. Interesting. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid our time is up. Thank you mm -hmm. so much, Stan. Well, thank you, Lynn. Uh, for being in the studio. And thank you all for watching. Uh, you've been watching in the studio. If you have time, just uh, log on to dctv.davismedia.org and check out some of our other programs. So we have, and episodes of In the Studio, we have uh, fabulous guests and uh, interesting topics. So thank you all from all of us, including our technical team, Diane, Charlene, and our other technical people. Thank you so much and see you next time.